Hey everyone, welcome back to another live community classroom with Michaels. Today we have Mary Beth Temple from Hooked for Life with us ready for another exciting class. Today we'll be knitting the Knit and Taja Mold Flower Pillow. My name is Lillian from Yarnspirations and I'll be helping with any questions you might have during today's class. Feel free to ask questions in the chat here and we'll be sure that Mary Beth answers them. And while we're getting started, feel free to let us know where you're watching from. Thanks, over to you Mary Beth. Hi, um, very happy to be back again. Uh, we're doing some knitting today. And uh, we are gonna talk specifically about this project, but the bulk of what we're after so far as what we're going to learn in this video today is intarsia style color work, sort of the difference between intarsia style and fair isle. So uh, let's get right to the tabletop camera and take a look at my knitting. All right, let me make it a little bit brighter for y'all. There we go. I have to turn it off when my face is on camera because otherwise I look like uh, Voldemort. My, <laughs> my face looks very light and it's not attractive. So, um, sorry, let me just adjust one more thing. Okay, so the big, well, let's, let's go right to the very beginning, right? So this is color work and we're going to knit in three colors. So in intarsia style of knitted color work, you're going to use a different skein or bobbin for each iteration of the color. You are not going to bring yarn across the back, which we call floating, because on a piece like this that has great big sections of color, you don't want to bring that float all the way across. First off, it can really mess your gauge up. Even if you twist as you go, you can really have some either too much looseness or too much tightness across the back. And also, particularly for something like this, which is a pillow, when this goes on its pillow form and it stretches out a little bit, you don't want to see the color that you're not using. So we're doing intarsia style. But again, all that means is each time a new color comes up, we're going to have a separate skein or bobbin. And again, uh, I'm not, it's not, you know, if you had one stitch, you wouldn't have to do that. There's a lot of sort of niceties about it that we are gonna talk about. Um, obviously, I'm not going to cast on this many stitches, this 71 stitches, because by the time I got through a row, it would, uh, my hour would be up. So I just have this little swatch here that I'm gonna work on. And we're, again, we're talking technique. So, most times for color work, you'll get a chart. And the reason the chart looks a little rectangular, even though the pillow is square, is because this is on a knitter style graph paper, because what a lot of people don't realize is that knit stitches, even in stockinette, are not perfectly square. So you need a little bit more height to accommodate the width. Generally speaking, uh, it, if you get five stitches to the inch, you might get seven rows to the inch. So you need extra rows to accommodate the width. So don't panic that the chart is not square. Your piece will be as long as you're getting gauge. The other thing I wanna talk about with charts, must, much like when we are on here doing stitch charts, we're going to go right to left. We're gonna read right to left. This is provided you're right-handed, of course, it's vice versa if you're left-handed. So you're going to knit right to left on the odd numbers rows, one, three, five, seven, nine, 11, et cetera. And when you're working the other rows, the even number rows, you're going to read left to right. And that is because we're knitting flat. And when you turn the work, you have to come in from the other side where it's not going to work so much. Another thing that's very common with these charts that will help you count when you need to count, because again, with intarsia, we're knitting large blocks of color. So sometimes you have to sit and count how many stitches you're going to have to knit, and it might be a sizable amount of stitches. It's not going to be two or three, like it might be for Fair Isle. The heavier gridded lines mark off a box that's 10 by 10. So if, for example, I wanted to count this row right here, I could go 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and there's one hanging out over here, so that would be 51. So I don't have to sit here and count every single block. So having those marked out in tens really helps you 
uh, helps you count how many stitches you have to do. The other thing I wanna talk about when you're doing a chart like this, sometimes if you're looking at this whole chart and you're trying to knit a particular row, it's really difficult to figure out what row you're on. And a lot of people were taught to put a card or a piece of paper and cover the bottom so that you know that you're knitting the row that is right over the paper. What I'd like to encourage you to try instead is go from the top down, put your paper above. And the reason is this, as I'm knitting, no matter what row I'm knitting, not only am I counting, but I'm looking at the number of stitches that I have and placing them in relationship to the stitches below. If I put my paper down here, I've covered them. It doesn't really help me. My count might be great, but if I started in the wrong place, if I've made a tiny little error, I can really go to town in the wrong place without realizing it. Whereas here, for example, say I was knitting this row right here. I'm going to see where those blue stitches are in relationship to the other blue stitches. And so if I'm knitting across and I notice my blue stitches are over here and not over here where they belong, then I know that I have made an error. And obviously it's far easier to uh, correct an error when you're very close to it as opposed to when you're 10 rows behind it. So I recommend that you put that little piece of paper on the top and then make it so that you're knitting the row that's closest to the piece of paper. There are other ways to do it. Some people like to just check off rows in pencil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But for me with 71 stitches in the chart and uh, 90 rows, I'm going to really lose my mind if I'm trying to guess, <laughs> if I'm trying to guess what row I'm on. Also for this piece and for a lot of color work pieces, we are working in stockinette, which is knit on the right side, curl on the wrong side. There are other ways to do color work, but uh, that's what we're doing today. The next that I know I'm not knitting yet, but these are all things that will help you on your little journey in intarsia. The next thing I wanna talk about is bobbins. Now, um, there are a million different ways to use bobbins. There are a million different bobbins, but go to Michael's, grab yourself a package of bobbins. I have to be 100% honest. I went to my Michael's this afternoon to see what kind of bobbins they had in stock so I could show you, but they were out because I live in a small city with a tiny Michael's. Uh, these are ones that I just had laying around from a big project I did last year, uh, but they don't all look like this, but I do like the plastic ones because they snap back pretty easily. But I have used, uh, again, I, was, I made this insanely complicated 22 bobbin knit blanket last year. And I kept having to buy more of these. And before they got delivered, uh, you know, during the pandemic, I literally cut a, a little X shape out of cardboard and used cardboard. You need that split to be there so that the yarn can move freely in and out as you knit it. You want to unwind it. You knit the next section, you unwind it. So again, no matter what brand or style of bobbin you have, you're going to have that little split there so the yarn can come in and out. Now, there are instances, and we will talk about it when we get there, there are instances in which you can work right off the skein of yarn, and you can certainly do that. You don't have to wind a bobbin for every single color. For example, again, talking about this pillow specifically, I don't need a bobbin for that orange center. I could conceivably just knit right off the ball or the skein of yarn because it's only in the center. It's not like there's orange here and then orange there and then orange there and I'm gonna need extra sections. It's only ever going to be here. So if I wanted to just use the ball of the yarn for that, I could. Again, as you do more color work projects and become more comfortable, you will find that, uh, well, I find I prefer the bobbins just because sometimes the yarn does get tangled when you're doing this kind of work. And if you have to untangle it, it is far simpler to untangle a whole stack of bobbins than it is to untangle a whole bunch of giant balls of Karen one pound. <laughs> so uh, as, again, as you sort of proceed on your journey, you may find that you prefer to wind bobbins even in instances like this where you don't technically need one. All right, Lillian, do we have any questions about tools or setting up? No, I think before, we're good so far. Before I get the knitting out, I'm gonna quick take a sip of water. Uh, no questions yet. All right, so 
again, I'm not going to be able to knit that flower pattern in the time allotted. So I just made a, a little sample right here. And somebody always asks, I am knitting on circular needles because I find it simpler to use circular needles when I am on camera because I don't have the tips of the straight needles banging onto the table or getting in the way or going off camera. You can certainly knit this particular project on straight needles if you wish to. So for the, uh, for the sake of argument, I am knitting away in my background color. And I come up to the point where I want to join my new color. I'm going to do one of the leaves on my flower, for example. All I'm going to do is knit that next stitch, leaving a tail, maybe four to six inches. Now that stitch is going to look a little loose and I am not going to worry about it because it's, um, it, it's something that I'll be able to tighten up when I weave in my ends. So I'm just going to grab that fold of yarn, go ahead and knit a couple stitches. Let's do three. So now I'm going to go back to my blue or my main color. Now, conceivably, because there's only three stitches, I could float the yarn, by which I mean bring it across the back. But since I know that I'm going to have far more than three yellow stitches in my next row and the subsequent rows, I'm gonna go ahead and add another bobbin right now because I may as well start as I mean to go on. So here's my next bobbin. Once again, I'm going to uh, just pull up a fold four to six inches in from the end. I can tighten it up when I weave in my ends. Let's see. All right, and then maybe it's time for my second second petal. Bring that fold four to six inches from the end. Going to knit my couple of stitches. Now I'm coming to the blue again. Here's the last bobbin. So again, in this particular instance, instance, I am using the skein of yarn in a couple of instances, but again, I'm doing it because I, uh, I needed some time and I can't manage 20 bobbins on camera. It's going to be a little bit crazy. So here, again, I'm not knitting the actual flower pattern from the pattern because that was far too many stitches. I'm sort of making it up as I go along, but our goal here is less making the pillow and more trying to get the hang of the technique. So this is what it looks like on the right side. This is what it looks like on the wrong side. So here's my bobbin waiting for me. And again, they're sitting here because there's really no place else for them to go the way my camera is set up. If I was sitting on the sofa knitting or sitting in my comfy armchair knitting, they'd be hanging off the back of the work. But I can't do that here because they'll get in the way of the camera and that will make a mess. So here's my tails. And I'm just gonna leave them there. I'm going to uh, deal with that in a little bit. Do we have any questions before I move on to the wrong side row? We have a couple of questions about bobbins. Yes. Darlene asks, are there any guidelines on how much yarn to put on the bobbins, like one yard for X number of stitches? Uh, I know it wouldn't be exact, but um, I wouldn't want a bunch of joins um, if it's too short. I do understand that. For a piece like this, I mean, it's a sizable amount of yarn that you're going to need. So for example, I'm going to use this, uh, this bobbin up all the way up to here. And then depending on if I'm going on to a right side or a wrong side, then it's going to attach. I only need one strand of yarn here, right? I don't need two bobbins of yellow because they join. So honestly, in a project like this with a big giant color block, I tend to get, this is, uh, they call these jumbo bobbins. This thing is huge and will hold close to 10 yards. 
I would wind everything on here that I could wind and you might have a join or two. Uh, but some of it is dumb luck. Sometimes if you're knitting in Tarja style and it's just a small little piece, you can, uh, you can figure it out pretty quickly. You know, you can wind, say you can wind two yards on all your bobbins and then you can see if you have a lot left. Because there are intarsia, uh, if you look at the work of Sally Melville, she does a lot of intarsia style knitting, uh, but there'll be repeats. There'll be a little item here and a little item here and a little item here and a little item here. And uh, interestingly, in some of her patterns, she will tell you approximately how many yards to put on the bobbin. My mission, I always put more than I think I need and hope for the best. But particularly in the yellow, you may, you may have a join here or there, but you're not going to have 90. Do you know what I mean? You might have one here, you might have one here. Three or four or five joins is not gonna kill you a um, hundred wood. I hope that makes sense. Lillian, anything else? Yeah, I think you've maybe already answered it, but um, Kate asked, could you cut the first bobbin, leave a tail and use that instead of a second bobbin of the background color? Could I use the first bobbin, cut a tail, and then what? Could you cut the first bobbin, leave a tail, and use that instead of a second bobbin for the background color? Float, the yeah. Again, I could, but I don't want to cut, I don't want to add tails. The whole um, point of this is to have fewer tails rather than more. So let's talk about what, again, I know you'd rather watch me knit than hear me talk, but uh, I do want you to sort of get the hang of this. Um, so when you bring the unused color behind the color that you're knitting with, that's called a float. My own personal rule, this is Mary Beth's rules of intarsia floats. This is not the knitting police will not come and get you if you believe a different thing. I will float up to and including five stitches. Anything after five stitches, I'm not floating it because I think it makes a mess. I think it uh, tends to block out unevenly and it's too easy to make a mess in the back. So in this instance, could I have floated my blue behind the yellow, used that same one all the way across, floated my blue behind the yellow, and then moved on to up here? Sure, but I don't have three, I have five. And then up here I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, not like 11. I'm going to have to do it eventually anyway. So the difference between intarsia and fair isle, fair isle is also what we call stranded knitting. And in Fair Isle, you are going to bring that yarn across the back, but you'll notice in Fair Isle patterns, they tend to be, again, smaller elements and stitch patterns with smaller amounts in the same colors. If you've got big color blocks like this, 99 times out of 100, it's going to be knit in Tarsha style. And again, it's to keep the back neat and to not waste a lot of yarn. If I've got to run yarn, blue yarn behind this yellow, forever and ever, that's going to suck up a lot of that blue yarn. Now we're using Karen one pound, so the amount of yards on the skein is not at issue, but sometimes it is. So you wanna make sure that you're not wasting yarn and making a dense tangled fabric on the back. But by and large, the, the mission is to have fewer ends, not more. I don't wanna cut if I don't have to ever because I hate weaving in ends and I don't wanna do it. Anything else before I move on, Lillian? Nope, I think you're good to go. All right, so let's move on. We're gonna do a wrong side row. So I'm going to purl. And I, again, I am making up this stitch pattern as I go. For the sake of our learning, I'm going to assume that uh, I'm going from three yellow to five yellow. I'm gonna extend one on either side. So I'm just doing that for the sake of having something to teach. Let's see if I can find the other end of my needle here without making too much of a mess. The other advantage to using circulars on camera is when I drop one, I can always pull the cable and find it. I have been known to throw straight needles uh, across the room inadvertently and just losing them entirely. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is twisting the yarn. And a lot of people get very confused by this. There are two ways to do it. And as long as you are internally consistent, it doesn't matter which way you do it. You just need to be consistent. You need to be consistent throughout your whole project. And once again, there are no knitting police. 
as long as you are internally consistent, you will be fine. I like to bring the new color under the old color. So every single time that I'm going to change color, I'm going to bring the working yarn of the new color under the working yarn of the old color. Can you do it vice versa? And were you taught like that? Absolutely, but you wanna be consistent. So for me today, I'm gonna to do new under old every single time. So here's my old and here's my new and my new color is under the old color. Now, do I need another bobbin here because I changed color? No, because it's one stitch that I moved. I extended one stitch. So we can go ahead and float that. There's the float. And we are not going to get upset about it one way or the other. Now, are some of these stitches acting a little loosey goosey? Yes, but that's because they're attached to tail yarn. And when I weave in my ends, I'm gonna tighten that right up. So here I am, I'm going to, I want this color, I want this one to be yellow. Now for me, new under old, now the yellow is old, the blue is new. So my new color came under my old color and I'm moving on living my little teal life. Now here we are again, I'm gonna extend this yellow one stitch on either side just for the sake of being interested. I'm not going to worry about this tail. I'm gonna tighten it up later. There's my old, here's my new, new under old, so yellow under blue. So you've also noticed I've had to get in my with my hand and, and give that a little tug. It, it's making the gauge even. You wanna make sure that all your stitches stay even. Now, blocking will eliminate a lot of sins. And I know that there are people out there in the world, I will never understand why, but I understand there's people in the world that do not like to block. Uh, stretching this on a pillow form is also going to hide a multitude of sins. But you do want to, as you're knitting, give it a little tug here and there to make sure that you don't have any stitches that are super tight or super loose. There's my new under my old, I'm going to purl to the end. So here's my back. Does it still look like a hot mess? Yes, <laughs> but it's because of the tails. I promise you by the time you get up to here, it'll make perfect sense. You'll have far less nonsense going on in the back. It's always a little sketchy when you're getting started. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna do that again. I'm now, instead of five, I'm gonna do seven yellow. Going to go ahead to the front. Again, you would be following along with your chart. Okay, I wanna change color. So new under old, there's my new. Making sure I'm getting my working yarn and not that tail under old. So in this case, the yellow is the new, the blue is the old. New comes under old. I'm going to knit across all my yellow stitches. Now you can see this is starting to pull up a little bit. So this is where I'm going to unwind some more yarn. Now I have enough yarn to knit with. This is a really unfortunate angle to be trying to do this on camera, I apologize. It's not nearly as hard as I am currently making it look. All right, and then we're gonna do new under old. There's my blue, which is new. Oops, that's the tail. There's my working yarn, here it is. All right, so I'm gonna bring that over. Now I want my yellow from this side. New under old. Okay. 
Here I am at the end, new under old. Oops, that's that tail again. Here's my working yarn. No, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's the angle. There we go. Okay, so here's my front. Again, am I panicked about this loose stitch here? No, I'm not because I guarantee that's attached to a tail. When I weave that in, I'll give that a little tug and it'll come in right the same gauge as everybody else. Same thing with this little gap right here. It's not worth panicking over. When I weave those ends in, I'm going to make sure to close any gaps and make sure that we don't have any problems. How are we doing, Lillian? We have any questions before I go and do the next thing? We are looking good. All right. So um, again, just in the interest of getting through this sort of project, on my next row, I'm going to extend my yellow. And then what's going to happen? I'm not going to need this bobbin anymore, so I'm going to have to get rid of it. So going back, I'm going to purl two in the blue. I'm going to work in the yellow. And when I get here, Again, with the assumption that we're doing this kind of a thing, we're at this pointy part of the bloom, we don't need it anymore. I'm going to trim that out, I don't need it. And then I'm going to do the same thing with the yellow. I don't, if I'm, I'm headed in this direction, I don't need this second bobbin because from here on out, it's just one color in the middle until I get to up here. I hope that makes sense. So uh, let's, let's go in that direction a little bit. Now, again, you notice I just, uh, I did it out of habit. I just untangled my bobbins a little bit. It's something that you will wind up doing as you knit, particularly when you, when you need more room and you let them go. Sometimes they get a little tangled. So every, you know, five or six rows, you may have to untangle them as you go. All right, so I'm gonna do my two blue. Gonna extend my yellow by one. So I'm going to bring my new color, which in this case is yellow under the old color. So when I get to here, I'm extending. So I don't need this blue anymore because I'm not going to use it. So I'm going to do sort of the reverse of what I did earlier. I'm going to leave a tail that's four to six inches so I can weave it in later. Now I'm going to cut the bobbin and pull it out because I don't need it. I'm going to need it later. I can set it aside. That yarn isn't wasted. Same thing here, since I know from looking at my pattern that I'm going to just continue along and not have uh, any sort of split, I don't really need this bobbin either. So I'm going to do the same thing. Cut a tail, pull it out. I don't need it. Oops, sorry, bang the camera there. Now there's one thing I do wanna say, again, not about this specific pattern, but about intarsia in general. If, for example, I, I came up here and I had my yellow and I was going to knit a couple rows where the center section is just yellow and then it was gonna veer off again, if it was gonna split again, even though those few rows are completely yellow, I would have left both bobbins attached. So it was not to have to add one later. Let me say that again. Here, let's uh, do this. So if I was knitting a different pattern and I got to the point where I didn't need that central blue bobbin anymore and I cut it and I was going to knit and purl a few rows simply in the yellow, 
But then after that, say after that, it was going to do this. Say after that, it was going to split again. And I knew that I was going to need to have two yellow bobbins again. Again, I, I, for those of you that are following along that are more advanced, this is what I'm talking about. In that case, even though the whole row is yellow, instead of running that whole single bobbin across and back and cutting the second one, I would twist them right here with new under old and work in both bobbins because that gives me two things. That means my one bobbin that's doing the bulk of the work, if I only used one, it's not going to run out. So I'm not going to have to join. And uh, alternatively, when I get to the point where I have to do that blue again, when I have to add that extra color back in, I have two bobbins sitting there waiting for me. I don't have to bring another one in that. Uh, again, it just cuts down on the number of ends you have to weave in later. So that, again, I want to be very clear, that's not for this specific pattern. That's if you're doing a different intarsia pattern, because bobbin placement is half the game with this. So I let go of this one. And again, I can do new under old, but honestly, all of that is going to settle itself out when I weave in my ends. So I'm not particularly worried about it. And uh, again, just for the sake of, of my sanity, I'm not gonna extend that yellow. I just wanna have two in the blue, so it's easy to knit. So now moving forward um, for the next couple of rows, I'm going to knit to see if you have any questions. I'm just gonna knit a couple simple rows. So I'm gonna have a blue bobbin on one side, a blue bobbin on the other side and a yellow bobbin in the middle. So once again, I'm just going to knit a couple of rows so you can see uh, what it looks like on the back when there are some rows done as opposed to this little mess that I have going on now because we just started a new project. And while I'm doing that, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you might have. We don't have any questions just yet, but I am gonna give it a moment and see if they come in. Okay, once again, new under all. Well, also after I knit a couple more rows, uh, I'll, I'll do a uh, do a, uh, a I'll do a little show and tell on the back because you'll see why that new under old works. Yes, we did just have a question uh, come in asking if you could review how to trap the floats. I mean, yes, except this is not that class. I don't okay. mean to to be rude. I don't want to confuse the issue since. Uh, the, the brief here is to focus on intarsia. I kind of don't want to get into float trapping and ferrile stranding because it's a different it's a different technique and I don't want to muddy the waters. Okay, got it. Uh, I do apologize to whoever asked that question. Uh, maybe your inspirations will book me for a stranded stranded color work class and, and we'll talk about that kind of thing. It sounds fun. <laughs> I just don't want to muddy the waters. You know, a lot of people take these classes because they're learning, um, they want to learn a specific technique. And so I don't want to confuse. Once again, new under old. Lillian, do we have anything else? I'm going to pull up some more yarn here. We do, yeah. Susan just asked, uh, how would you handle a transition that is over three stitches? like more or less, rather than just one going in each direction? Um, again, I would float it. I would bring the unused color behind the color I was knitting with and I would do new under old. I would not worry about trapping floats for five stitches or less. That's what I was saying earlier about generally in an intarsia, pro pro bleh, in an intarsia project, I don't float more than five stitches. And uh, the reason is because I don't want to trap floats. And again, for those of you who don't know what trapping a float is and don't care to learn, that's fine. It's not a technique that we're, we're going to need in this particular project. Uh, it's a, a matter of when you have a float that's over five inches, it's a technique about twisting the yarn so that uh, there's no ginormous strand of yarn hanging out the back. 
but in this pattern, it doesn't come up. The only place it could conceivably come up is in that first row where there's only three stitches in the yellow. The only place it could conceivably come up in this pattern is these two rows, uh, uh, these two sections, which is one row and that section at the end. And again, I just, I simply wouldn't bother because I know I'm gonna need the yellow later. If there was a section that was just three stitches of the yellow and then this was a different color, it was like orange or whatever, uh, then I would float, absolutely. But it, to me, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to try and avoid placing a bobbin when you're gonna to have to do it in 10 minutes anyway. I hope that makes sense. Untangling my bobbins a little bit. There we go. And I literally, when I, again, when if I'm sitting on the sofa or I'm sitting in an armchair, or I'm watching TV and living my life and knitting, I, I do let the bobbins dangle off the back. New under old. Do you mind if I pop in with a question? Uh, no, go right ahead. I was just trying to get to the end of this row and then I have more interesting things to say. So now's a good time, Lillian. Perfect. Uh, there's a question here from Jackie asking, you were saying you would use two yellow bobbins even though you're going across in a solid line. When do you in an instance where I knew they were going to, if, if I knew that color was going to split again. Okay. Yeah. Again, for this pillow specifically, I would not do that. I would do what I did, which is I'd go down to one bobbin and just use the one going back and forth. But in an instance where I say I did these couple of rows and I knew I was gonna split my color again because it was a different pattern, then I would go ahead and leave the two bobbins. And again, I'm not trying to confuse the issue. The only reason I mentioned it is because in other intarsia patterns, not this one specifically, uh, it does come up. And a lot of people don't realize you can use two or more bobbins in the row, even if it's all one color, if it makes your life easier in the long run. But that's the only way I would do that is if I needed to split later. And if I needed to split after a couple of rows, if again, now, all right, let's talk about this pattern specifically. When I get up to here, which is what I was gonna do in two rows, I am gonna need two yellow again. I'm gonna have to split my yellow, right? But that's a lot of knitting. So to me personally, I'm gonna go ahead and do that in the one bobbin or ball of yarn. Maybe that's the uh, area that I have my whole skein attached. Maybe that's not a bobbin. And when I get up here, I'm gonna add my second bobbin. If, all right, now I'm really getting crazy. <laughs> all right, bear with me. <laughs> Those of you that have taken my Michaels classes before, you know I'm always drawing or sketching or doing something. Um, Say, for example, though, that was all the solid yellow rows I had to do before I was before I was going to split. In this case, this is what I was talking about. This is a case that I would use my yellow bob until I got here. I'd use my other yellow bob until I got here. Going back, I'd do the yellow bobbin. I'd do my new under old. I'd do the second yellow bobbin. And then when I came back here, I would add my orange. And the reason I would do that with only a couple of solid rows is because I know that there is a split coming. Now, could you do that with this many yellow rows? If you're knitting this pillow, you absolutely can if, that, um, if that's how it works in your brain. But to me, that's a lot of knitting and I, do, I don't need that second bobbin. And to me, I'd just as soon add the second bobbin up there. The other thing is this, there's only so many yards you're gonna get on that bobbin. So maybe I don't wanna have to wind another bobbin. Maybe I wanna just use the one and then keep that second one to add up here. But that one is really dealer's choice. And I hope having that visual aid made it uh, a little more understandable. 
Lillian, do we have anything else before I go on to the next thing? Yeah, there's a follow-up question here from Michelle asking, do you have a minimum amount of rows you keep uh, both bobbins before splitting again versus using one for many rows? Again, here's the thing, there are no knitting police and you can split or not split as you wish. Is there a rule? Is there a no? Um, again, I know on a jumbo, I can only get about 10 yards. So to me, if I'm gonna use up 10 yards, I'm, I'm gonna not, I, I'm going to uh, just work off the one bobbin and refill that one bobbin. Uh, but is there a very specific rule? No, not really, there isn't. Anything else before we go on? No, we're all good. Okay, so this is the part that I was waiting to show you. Even when this piece is enormous, you can see that the colors are twining in and out of each other along the edge. And again, I feel like this is where a lot of people really run amok when they're learning intarsia. They feel like they have to twist the yarn and twist the yarn and twist the yarn to make sure that the gap is closed and there's no hole in here. But using the new under old, every single time you change colors forms this little edging right here on the wrong side and it closes the gap. What would happen if you did not do new under old, if you did not twist? Well, you'd have two separate pieces of knitting that were not attached. You know, it's one thing when you're when you're extending colors on either side, obviously that's gonna hold together. But you need it to be one cohesive piece of knitting, not a whole bunches of pieces of knitting that you just happen to be knitting at the same time. So using that new under old, again, looks super close, you can see it. Here's my one color, here's my other color, here's my one color. Now, if I was extending two or three or four stitches, those little zigzags are going to be bigger. But those are what's holding the color work sections together and making it one cohesive piece of knitting. So that is why it is so important to do that new, new under old, but it's also all you need to do. You don't need to go crazy adding additional twists and freaking out and worrying about it. New under old will do the job with the least amount of chaos possible. So I'm gonna go ahead and purl back on this row and then I'm gonna add my orange in the middle, just to keep things interesting. But I have really gone through most of the important points that I wanted to make. So I'm gonna, I, we're whipping through this content. So I'm gonna knit for a little while longer. And if you have more questions, please ask them. But on my next row, I'm gonna add my orange in the middle again, just to talk about one more time how to add that. Once again, every single time I change color, new under old. See, and, and there's my little ziggy zags, keeping everything together and staying neat on the outside. Give myself a little more yarn to work with here. Find my orange bobbin because I'm going to need that next. All right. So in this instance, uh, instead of extending the yellow, I'm going to make the uh, yellow more narrow. So. Uh, let's go ahead and, uh, for an example, let's go ahead and knit two stitches of the yellow. We're going to bring it in two. So now I need my yellow and I'm still doing new under old, but this is what I was saying. I, in fact, I'll wait till I get to the back and I'll show you too, but this is what I'm saying about sometimes that zigzags a little longer or 
uh, because it depends on how many stitches you're bringing it across. So let's see, let's knit five for just for example, one, two, eh, let's just do four. And now I'm going to bring my orange color in. So I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to bring up my fold four to six inches from the end and I'm just going to knit with it. And here, making sure that you're knitting with the, uh, I made a little mess here, making sure with the, that you're uh, knitting with the working yarn, not the tail, which is what I just did. So let's try that again. There we go. Two. Three, now I'm splitting my color. So I'm adding that second yellow bobbin back in because I'm splitting. Again, technically it's new under old, but I'm not getting crazy about it because I'll tighten it up when I weave in the ends. You do not want to unwind, do you? They're far easier to unwind when they're hanging down the back. Again, I don't normally knit with them sitting on the table like this. I like to let them hang down the back. So now I'm going to uh, bring my blue all the way over because I'm, I'm getting rid of two yellow, new under old. One, two, three. All right, let's take a look at the wrong side row. <laughs> Let me get untangled. One, two, three, four. New under old. I didn't uh, change the number of stitches on this row. I did uh, sort of a work even. Again, because I just think we have enough going on on this teeny tiny amount of space that I can show on camera. No reason to make us all crazy. Again, these stitches are loose because there's tails right there. I'm not getting excited about it. I'll fix it later. New under old, and I'll close that gap when I weave in the ends. New under old. Can I ask a couple of questions? Um, actually, if you could give me one second, because I want to curl these four stitches and then I just want to point one thing out and then I am all about the questions. Of course. So here's my little ziggy zaggy here that went over two stitches. So my point uh, was that it is a this guy's a little longer than these guys and that's because it went farther. So again, don't be worried if your little zigzags around the outside, if they change length, they're going to do that depending on the number of stitches that you're crossing. Now it's your turn, Lillian. <laughs> okay, it's actually Kathy's turn. Um, okay. There's a question here. She says, is it easier to add a color on a knit row than a pearl row? Um, honestly, I don't think it makes a whole ton of difference. I did it in the in the purposes of this video, it was easier for me because you're not looking at all this madness on the back, you know what I mean? Uh, but yeah, you will add a color on whatever row the chart tells you to. And if you do it the way I showed you in which you're just pulling up a fold four to six inches from the end, it doesn't matter if you do it on a knit stitch or a purl stitch. Okay, and there's a question here from Darlene asking, when adding a new color, 
Is it helpful if you put a knot in that you take out later to keep it a little bit more consistent in tension? Uh, I struggle with weaving in uh, my ends of knitting and I'm afraid I might not tug tight enough. Huh. Um, yeah. If Now, I would absolutely undo the knot later. I am uh, One of the things I am a purist is about is I don't think there should be any knots in knitting or crochet. Um, I'll tell you a, a funny, I took a class in some kind of yarn. Uh, it was making a magic ball and you had to tie knots in your yarn and then knit past them. And I almost lost my mind in the class because I hate knots. Uh, but sure, if you wanted to, uh, but again, I don't like, so in this instance, you could conceivably, okay, I'm really just punting here. You could conceivably, see, I don't know what you would knot it to. Do you know what I mean? You wouldn't want to knot it to the working yarn because then when you took the knot out, that stitch is going to be too big. Like, okay, when you're adding? No, I honestly, I don't know what you would knot it to. So like here, this is where I added my orange, right? Because here's my tail. There's nothing to tie it to. You know what I mean? Because this is the working yarn that's going to move forward and the yellow yarn kept it. So I don't know what you would tie it to. It's just hanging out there in the void. Um, so I don't know that tying it to something is going to be helpful. So I know I just said it was okay to tie it, but again, looking at it now, I don't know what you would tie it to. So I don't think um, putting, putting a knot would be a good idea, even if you intended to take it out later. Lillian, do we have anything else? We have just a couple minutes left. Uh, I think we're okay. You've answered everyone's questions. Um, oh, Judy says uh, perhaps you meant like a slip knot, like when you're beginning to cast on. But but again, I don't I don't know why you would. I, mm -hmm. I, I I am not trying to sound flippant. I don't know what the benefit would be to that. <laughs> so it's not something I personally would do. But again, the only you're seeing a lot of loose stitches on this sample because it's only this big. Do you know what I mean? If you're looking at this giant pillow, you know, that's 14 inches square or however big it is. Uh, oh, pardon me, it's 18 inches square. You're not going to have 20 loose stitches. You know, you're going to have one wherever you joined a bobbin. So um, honestly, when you're weaving ends, just make sure that you're, so if I'm weaving my end in, I can see that that stitch is a little too big. I'm just going to give it a little tug. And again, for this pillow specifically, but for other work in general, blocking and or stretching it, stretching it over a pillow form hides a multitude of sins. If this stitch is not 100% perfect, the exact same gauge as everything else, if you uh, block it later, it should even out on its own. But I wouldn't block it until I would weave my ends in first, and then I would block it in this instance. Mm, that's a good tip. Anything else, Lillian? Uh, sorry, there's lots popping in at the moment. <laughs> uh, we, Wendy uh, asks, are you going to show uh, how to weave the ends in? Uh, She's used, used to new colors at the end of a row. So I think maybe because it's, they're all in the middle and there's lots of colors around, it's a little tricky. Okay, you keep asking questions. I'm going to look and see if I have a yarn needle by me. I may not. <laughs> So I may not do it, but it, it's not for lack of interest. I don't know what tools I brought in with me today. It's been a very hectic week. Okay, I do not have a yarn needle with me. Um, here's what I would like to say about that. What I would like you to do when you're weaving in your ends is make sure that you are weaving in your ends in the same color as the tail that you're weaving in. So I would not take the yellow and weave it in in the blue because you may see that. I would make sure that I was weaving my yellow in over the yellow. But generally what I do when I'm weaving in ends is I go under, so if you look at the um, crud, I really wish I had a yarn needle, but I do not. All right, hang on. All right, we're, we're being inventive here. I have an embroidery needle. <laughs> Uh, which I'm obviously not going to be able to thread. But what I like to do is, uh, so if you look at uh, the reverse side of a stockinette, 
you have a loop that uh, one that uh, faces up and one that faces down. What I like to do is go under one that faces up and then one that faces down on the diagonal. So I bring my yarn through here and then I go down this one. So I do it on the diagonal so that you're not pulling your stitches out of, but I'm weaving in in this direction and I'm making sure that I'm using a tail uh, that is uh, that I'm weaving the tail into knitting that is the same color as the tail. Whew, that did not want to come out of my mouth. <laughs> Anything else, Lillian, before we go? We've only got three minutes left. Uh, yes. Um, Kathy uh, just asked for confirmation, does that close up the holes? And Susan asked, uh, how many times are you weaving back and forth? I personally do it three times. There are no knitting police. Nobody will come and get you if you do it two or four. For me, it's three. And uh, what will close up the hole, whoever asked that question, mm -hmm. is the amount of tension that you put on the yarn. So I wanna pull it until it, the stitch looks like the other stitches. If, even if I wove it in properly, for example, and I had it loose and sloppy like this, that's not gonna close that hole up. I need to physically put some tension on that tail until I'm happy with it, till it looks like it's brothers. And then I'm gonna to go to the back and weave in. Mm -hmm. Now, if that gap is too big, there's no law that says you can't, oh, where's my, I'm so sorry, you guys, that I do not have a tapestry needle. I will make sure to have one next time. There's no reason that says that you can't bring that yellow up under this teal guy right here to close that gap if you need to. Do you know what I mean? If you have to bring it this way to close it, there's no reason that you can't and then do your diagonals up here on the yellow. Mm, but kind of like you're closes, continuing the stitch, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah but what it. closes the gap is the amount of tension you put on the tail. Okay, I think you've covered all the questions, but I just would like to uh, read a little bit of feedback. All right. uh, Darlene says, I would like to thank you for today's class. I feel I have picked up a new tool for my knit toolbox. And well, Kathy, thank you. that's very kind. Kathy says, this is absolutely the best knitting class that Michael's has had offered through the year. I like that it covered so much and that strategies, oh my God, topics didn't confuse us. Uh, there were so many little hints. Thank you so much. And Judy says, uh, nice weave technique, important. Uh, to do a couple of the reverses so it doesn't work back out. Um, and uh, Diana also says, uh, thanks so much. We have wondered so long on how to do this. <laughs> Tina said, awesome classes and sent you your heart. Oh, well, thank you so much. The thing with intarsia, like many other techniques, um, it's one of those things that you can read it in a book, but honestly, once you see it, it's so much easier when somebody just shows you. You know what I mean? And some of these techniques seem so off-putting and then you see somebody do it and you go, oh, well, that's easy, I can do that. And that's the thing with knitting, it is not brain surgery, you know, you can, you can do it. Um, I, I will put one quick plug in here and say, uh, follow me on Instagram at hooked number four life LLC and uh, show me your projects, send me, send me messages if you have questions. Uh, that's the easiest place to find me. You know, I have a blog and all that kind of stuff too, which I'm sure they linked, but uh, if you follow us on Instagram, that's the easiest way to get a message to me that somebody will actually see in a short amount of time. All right, I'm going to go back to my hello and goodbye camera to say goodbye, and then Lillian can do her thing. Thank you so much for joining me, you guys. Uh, next week I'm teaching sewing, but I'm, I'm here frequently. I have lots of great knitting and crocheting stuff to teach you, and I really, truly appreciate when you come by. Thanks for joining us today for this live community classroom with Michaels. And don't forget, you can share your work with hashtag make it with Michaels and hashtag Yarnspirations. And just a reminder that you can find more classes on michaels.com and the recording of today's class at michaels.com slash classes. Thanks for joining us. And thank you so much, Mary Beth. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>